All right, we are recording now. All right, welcome everyone to the monthly uh, virtual EFF Austin meetup. Um, uh, <laughs> you have no idea how hard managing these meetups every month is, Grayson. You have no idea. <laughs> um, so anyway, welcome everyone. Um, I see old and new faces. Um, and so for those of you who are new and like, hey, what's EFF Austin? We are a longstanding uh, digital civil liberties organization based here in Austin. Um, we're about to celebrate our 30th anniversary. Um, we are very affiliated and involved in the history of the founding of Electronic Frontier Foundation based in San Francisco, the nation's foremost digital civil liberties organization. You can think of them as the ACLU for the internet. They work on like, defending net neutrality, end-to-end -end encryption, Section 230 of the CDA, all sorts of good stuff that help keep the internet the wonderful anarchist space for sharing knowledge and information at annoying curmudgeonly authoritarians around the world uh, for over 30 years now. Um, so they're great people. You should donate to them. You should volunteer with them. And um, EFF Austin is actually the oldest member of what is called the EFA or the Electronic Frontier Alliance. It's a, a, a network of now probably over, at this point over a hundred organizations around the US and a few internationally who coordinate in a decentralized fashion with EFF on vital digital civil liberties issues. Uh, there's probably one near you, get involved, uh, reach out, Google Electronic Frontier Alliance and find if there's somebody near you. Though I'm actually sad to tell you that if you're in Texas, we're all you've got. Uh, we're actually the only EFA member in Texas, which is insane given how big Texas is, but that's how it goes. <laughs> so um, we traditionally have held these meetups monthly downtown in Austin at Capital Factory. They've been on a hiatus since the COVID times. Uh, interestingly related somewhat to tonight's talk, but um, yeah, we've not been having in person for a while. We've been doing these uh, virtually. They like our physical ones have been on the second Tuesday of every month at 7 p.m. and will continue being for the time going forward. We hopefully sometime in the next several-ish months might start thinking about having in-person again. Um, there's no set timetable. We'll keep you all informed. It just depends on how the rollout goes and how things look. Um, we also hope that even when we do resume in person. We know that these virtual meetups are far more accessible for some people than the in-person ones are. Uh, just having one, you may not even live in Austin or two, if you do, getting downtown can involve time and driving and money and et cetera. We don't want to go back to a situation where people are not being able to access. So I'm really going to be exploring finding a way if we do go back to in-person to uh, potentially simulcast the meetups to the Zoom room, but I want to get the best of both worlds. So I'm gonna be actively exploring that. Um, we also, um, in addition to these meetups, we do a bunch of other stuff in non-COVID times. We often throw fun uh, fundraisers slash cyberpunk parties. We also rabble rouse um, about, uh, you know, various bills we like or don't like at the Texas Ledge. Um, you know, even though primarily we mostly do education, we do do a bit of advocacy policy work like National EFF does. Um, in particular, there are a few uh, bills you should definitely register your displeasure with that are going on in the Texas Ledge right now. I forget the exact number, but I will share it in the chat. But one particularly nasty bill that has passed the Texas Senate and is currently in committee in the Texas House, it may make it out, is a wonderfully privacy horrifying bill that will essentially make a statewide database of every woman in Texas who's ever even thought about getting an abortion. So yeah, if that sounds like a dumpster fire to you, you should let them know that's a terrible idea. I'll share the number of this bill in the chat. Um, but yeah, that is one of uh, many things we do and don't do. Um, but yeah, um, I will be turning things over to our speaker here in a second. Daniel, uh, has spoken to Eddie F. Fawson before. He's a good friend of ours. He does a lot of volunteer work at Open Austin League of Women Voters. Great guy. Um, before we get started, I first like to briefly check in and see if any members of the community have any announcements they would uh, like to share with us. Shameless self promotions totally allowed. You know, as long as you think it would be of interest mm -hmm. to the digital civil liberties community, um, I welcome you sharing it here. Uh, is there anything somebody would like to share? Well, our speaker Daniel would like to share something. What would you like to share? I would like to share something. Yes. Um, there's an election coming up. Oh, yes. That's uh, very important. Uh, yes, there is an Austin election coming up. And while 
it doesn't necessarily directly influence um, EFFE sort of issues at the same time. If you do live in Austin, hey, we're big believers in civic engagement and voting. So yeah, research the props and you know vote regardless of how you feel on each of them because they're pretty impactful. They're going to actually change life in Austin a lot depending on which of them pass and don't pass. So don't miss the selection. Thank you for the yep. reminder, Daniel. Yeah, early voting starts the, uh, I believe the 19th, uh, maybe the, yeah, the 19th. That sounds about right, but I'd have to go double check. Um, yeah, any other announcements anybody would like to share before I introduce Daniel? Uh, there's the uh, Texas A&M Bitcoin conferences on Saturday. Oh, Friday. Yes. Um, is um, is Ooh. that is there a uh, URL you can share with more information about that? Uh, I don't remember it off the top of my head. It's uh, maze.tamu.edu and something after that. All right, uh, but Texas Bitcoin see. Conference or Texas A&M Bitcoin Conference. A&M Bitcoin Conference. Uh, okay, got it. Um, yeah, thanks for letting us know that. Appreciate that. Definitely, that is something that would potentially interest this community. Um, so thanks a lot for that. Um, yes, George. Did you have a question, George? I can't hear you. We can come back to you later. You can share it in the chat if your mic is acting up, but I do not hear you. Hmm. All right. Uh, any other announcements? And George, as I said, you can type it in the chat if you're having mic issues. All right, I think uh, that seems like the announcements and I will be sharing a number of links in the chat relevant to these issues. I've also tried to find a link about that Bitcoin conference for everyone, um, but yeah. So first, just a quick little introduction. Um, our speaker this month is Daniel Russler. I think I said Daniel's last name correctly. He should correct me if I did not, <laughs> but- That's good. Okay. Um, Daniel is a project lead at Open Austin, which is a civic tech meetup and brigade of Code for America. They've been longtime EF of Austin friends and supporters. He does a bunch of other cool stuff too, mostly focusing on privacy, voting, and climate change. His personal website, which I can share in the comments, is daylightpirates.org. But yes, Daniel has worked on a lot of cool projects over the years. We've had him uh, speak at EFF of Austin before, talking about some of his projects detangling the mystery of what voting machine barcode scanners encode and all sorts of other fun stuff. Um, so I reached out to Daniel because my original thoughts of who was going to speak this month went MIA on me, and so I needed a speaker. And Daniel proposed a topic that sounded incredibly timely to me. So I thought, well, let's do it. Now I'm going to do a little bit of a preamble here, as I sort of already talked a little bit about with Daniel. But as you might know, vaccine ca passports, they're a controversial topic in the civil liberties and digital civil liberties communities. In fact, both the official stance of the ACLU and EFF is extremely skeptical to negative on them actually. And in fact, I will be sharing the link to both of their articles outlining many of the real problems in a lot of the proposals we're seeing around how these things would be implemented. Though, as you might guess, most of the problems revolve around issues of equity and privacy, as makes a lot of sense. Um, that being said, Daniel um, is somebody who I will say uh, is an EFF and EFL support for years, believes strongly in pr these principles of privacy and equity. And Daniel's also a very smart guy. And so Daniel came to me and basically is like, hey, I've been working on a coding project that I hope will solve some of these problems that will let local communities feel that they can be confident about that they are running a safe community where people are vaccinated, but not done in a way that's gonna involve it, mass government tracking or forbidding people from freely moving unless their name is on the right government list, et cetera. So um, yeah, I, uh, I wanted Daniel to come and talk about what is an interesting controversial topic. And hopefully maybe we can dispel a bit of what I believe is a false binary that to care about these privacy issues is to, or health data or equity is to be anti-science or anti-vax. I don't think we have to accept an either or on this. So um, without further ado, I'm gonna throw things over to Daniel who's gonna talk to you about his 
a free and open source project to solve this problem. He's going to, knowing him, walk us through the code and the implementation at a somewhat technical level. And yeah, if you have issues with this idea, grow him on it. He wants to hear them because he wants to solve this problem. And I really hope he has maybe solved it because it certainly could be useful for us in restarting our personal events if this could be done in a way that respects people's privacy and equity. So without further ado, take it away, Daniel. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Um, that was a great intro. Um, this is quite the controversial topic. I actually started working on this project well before it became a controversial topic, but now it's uh, there's headlines everywhere about it. Vaccine passports, vaccine passports, vaccine passports. So um, it's been quite interesting to see the topic um, grow and change over the over the past few years. So um, if uh, I I wonder if there's anybody. I think there's a few people here who saw my last talk on ballot barcodes. And if you remember in that talk, I actually dove into like how a barcode works and all of that sort of stuff and how these barcodes on the ba new ballots in Travis County um, actually work and how they encode the, your, your, voter, your voter selections uh, when they get scanned for the actual ballot. And so um, if you can remember, those were straight barcodes, just like you know the barcodes you get see at the supermarket. Um, well, now I'm adding a dimension. And so now we have two dimensional barcodes that we're going to talk about. <laughs> but I, I, I don't think that I want to, like, I'm not going to be diving into the actual, like, how a QR code is made um, in this talk. So I'm not going to the depth that I went in the last, in the last talk. But um, I think this is a, a pretty important topic. So uh, Kevin, just to be, just to make sure you can, everybody can see my screen, right? Yeah, I can see it. <laughs> okay, great. Okay, so um, this uh, project uh, is, you know, based out of, as, as Kevin said, uh, uh, the Code for America Brigade, which is like a network of meetups throughout the US um, uh, for Open Austin. And Open Austin is kind of like a civic tech engagement group. And when uh, the shutdowns happened last year, you know, we started meeting online, but there was a giant question of, well, how do we know when we can actually start up again? Like there was a lot of debate. And I feel like the consensus has kind of landed on when everybody's vaccinated or like when everybody who comes to the meetup is vaccinated, that's when we can start to resume in person again. So there's questions about like capacity or not capacity or whatever. And that's just like, it never really got consensus. Um, everything kind of congealed around if everybody's vaccinated, we can start meeting up again. And that was the, that was kind of the threshold. And, you know, the question becomes if a vaccine rollout takes a long period of time, um, how do you actually know that? Like, how does, how do you actually, you know, build a system that does that? And the first thing that came to my head is, well, it's going to be some giant IBM thing that cost a hundred million dollars for, you know, whatever admin presidential administration to buy, and they're going to roll it out and it's going to be a giant shit show. And it's going to require some proprietary app and it's going to have all this sort of stuff. And I was like, well, like, how can we actually solve this? So, uh, this is like, I'm jumping right in. This is a demo of it. You can use it right now. So if you have a QR code scanner, or if you go to vax.codes slash scan um, on your phone with a camera or your computer with a webcam, you can actually like turn your webcam around and do it because it just works in the browser. Um, you can scan this image and see that um, this is uh, John Doe who, uh, who has been verified by test movie theater. And so... What this is demonstrating here is what is called a public key infrastructure. So essentially a lot of the uh, vaccine passport type stuff either falls into the camp of, you know, centralized database of approved QR codes or some sort of publicly key signed thing. And I think the Linux Foundation is working on one of those with their verifiable credentials initiative. Um, it's a little bit more robust and complex and has a lot more information in it than this does. Um, this is much more loose ad hoc and I'll get into that later. Um, but essentially this is a QR code that encodes some information and just verifies that that information has been issued by a test movie theater, okay? Um, just to, it's, 
anybody who has actually scanned this, can you unmute and verify that it actually worked? I, I'm actually testing. It's in beta right now, so I, I would love to hear if it actually it, works. It looks like it's working. Yay! Awesome. Okay, great. Okay, so I'll, I'll bring this slide back up later. Um, so it's okay if you if you want to get a chance to scan it later. Um, but essentially, that's that's how it would work. Is somebody presents to you like hey, I have this code and I want to go watch this movie for a vaccine only showing of this at this, at this movie theater. Um, the movie theater scans it, they verify that they trust the issuer and that's it, they let them in. And it's arbitrary what content you include so the issuer can just be the movie theater and include the ticket number. Okay, so um, as I started off with, like this was really built around the idea of when can we actually show up back at person? Like we suspended in-person meetups. Um, we kind of kind of settled on, we can start meeting up again when everybody's vaccinated as like, it seems like Kevin is going through the same sort of questioning and, and figuring out himself. Um, and then, you know, how do we figure out if somebody's vaccinated? One of the key projects or key goals of this project was that we assume that any sort of this, keep in mind, this project was like uh, originally kind of, I started thinking about it way back, uh, you know, in the Trump administration, you know, I was assuming that the rollout would be a shit show. And so like basically the entire requirements of this project was it had to be local only, right? It had to be open source, had to be easy to use, and it could be bootstrapped really easily by a local organization for their own local purposes. Okay, so in that sort of a scenario, trust is not an issue. You personally know, or you know very well, these organizations that you are trusting, right? So like the movie theater can be its own issuer and issue like tickets with these QR codes after they've, you know, verified uh, at some previous like location, like you bring in your, your vaccine and you show them and they issue a QR code and then, you know, you... Um, it, for all the subsequent showings, you just show your QR code and it'll, it'll uh, show that you've been verified by that theater. So it's a very ad hoc bootstrapped public key infrastructure system um, was where it kind of started from was, you know, don't assume any sort of organization at the state level, at the, you know, at the national level, and obviously not state level now in Texas, which I'll get to. So um, as Kevin said, recently vaccine passports have become a very, very hot topic. New York um, uh, was, I think, the first one to officially designate some sort of a vaccine passport system, and a lot of airlines are now requiring it, and apparently a lot of international countries are now looking at building it up, and so it's a very, very, um, you know, uh, topic of focus, um, but our project was not, like, it was, like, just let's just see if we can get this doing, you know, something good for our local meetup. Let's not try to conquer the world with this thing. Um, and then, you know, last week, all this shit got banned in Texas. So, you know, the and in Florida. So Governor uh, Abbott um, issued a executive order that government mandated vaccine passports or government mandated vaccine verifications were not to be uh, allowed by state or state funded agencies. So anybody that receives taxpayer funds is not allowed to ask for vaccine verification in the state of Texas. Now that's all he is empowered to do because it's an executive order. Um, and so he can't like go in and ban movie theaters from having vaccine only showings or, um, you know, uh, uh, private events from having vaccine only requirements. Um, and so um, there is quite a bit of room left in Texas. Um, and so that actually may be a better fit for us because that's kind of this project's bread and butter is local stuff. Um, it's not intended to be like you know, you have to have it in order to get into the airport or something like that. That's for the, you know, major players who actually, you know, can who have budgets for, for those sort of things, those robust things. So this is much for a, a local ad hoc stuff. So I don't see um, these executive orders as being necessarily um, a showstopper for this project. So we can, when we can totally discuss this later on in the talk, I just want to get through. So, um, 
Next, I want to cover how the system actually works. So there are three people in the, in the chain here. There's the issuer. So the issuer is the person who has the key file or the public private key pair and can issue QR codes, basically sign a piece of content that gets embedded in a QR code. Um, they then, you know, uh, re like receive people who have received the vaccine. So they, you know, maybe operate a kiosk or have a meetup like this, where it's like a key signing party for, if you remember the days of PGP or like web of trust. So, um, which I guess still go on. I'm just curious to know how it happens over zoom. Um, so the, uh, a person shows the issuer their vaccine record card. So they're like, here you go. You know, it's, you know, they check it out to make sure it's legit or, you know, whatever sort of checking they need to do. There are no instructions on how to do that. This is completely up to the local community leaders or the issuers to figure out what they do. The issuer then creates a QR code with that signature and the content identifying the person. And so that content is arbitrary. It can be a name, it can be a membership number, it can be something. And then local organizers who trust that issuer, so say you're part of a network of gyms or maybe a network of Dungeons and Dragons leagues, um, you can basically just require that when somebody RSVPs or when they show up to the door or something like that, they show you the QR code. And so the, the, the person who has issued the QR code doesn't have to have a phone. They can just have it on a piece of paper that gets printed out by the issuer. They can just carry it around in their wallet or whatever. And so they can just show the, the local organizer or business the QR code. The, uh, the organizer scans it in some form or fashion. Like if they get emailed it, they can just upload an image of it. If they um, have their phone, they can just scan it on their phone. There's no app required or anything like that. Um, so they scan it. They see who issued it and they, they, they know who issued it or they should know who issued it, right? They should know, oh, that's such and such. That's the local, you know, league leader for the Dungeons and Dragons League. Okay, they're the ones who issued it. I trust them. Okay, I'm going to assume that this is verified. And so it's really built on a personal trust network. It's not trying to build any sort of international trust network or something that is verifiable through Bitcoin or through the Bitcoin network or whatever. So it, it's really all about personal connections and personal trust is what this system is based on, which is why it's on a kind of a really hyper local focused system or an internal use system. So say, you know, an employer employees or a, you know, a venue music concert goers, that sort of thing. So it's not, it's, uh, it's really built for local and internal purposes. Okay. Um, so back to the actual QR code itself. Um, actually, before I do that, like, is there any questions on, on how it works? I certainly will probably have a number of questions, and, but I'm happy to save them till you get through your presentation. <laughs> okay, great. Um, was using that to take a drink of water, but here we go. Okay, okay. So uh, back to the actual QR code itself. If you were to scan this code using a QR code scanner app or something like that, you're gonna see something that looks like this. This is the link. This is the actual encoded value in the QR code itself, right? And so it's pretty long. And what it is, is a series of, oops, I actually clicked on it, Doop. take it over there. Okay, what it is, is it's a series of um, three values. And so if you go back um, and see, there's a V1, there's test movies, then there's a long string of characters, and then there's John Doe percent encoded, right? And so those three values are the issuer ID, so who issued it, the signature, and the content that was signed. Okay, and so the issue ID is basically the query value. So when you load the page, there's an API of pre-registered issuers. Um, so if you wanna be verified on these links, you have to basically register as an issuer. That's the only like people who have to register anything. Um, scanners and recipients of codes don't have to register anything. It's just the issuers. 
Um, so they have to be registered on the API with their public key on the API. Um, then the signature that they create when they create the code, so that's that long string of characters, and then the content that is signed. And so um, the other important part of this link is that little pound sign in between scan and V1. So that's called a URL fragment. And so if you know anything about um, the way URLs are constructed, is this first part of the URL um, is, is what is sent to the server. So when you click on this link, it loads, <clears throat> excuse me, it loads backs.codes slash scan. It sends a request to the a get request to the server to get the code or the HTML for that page. Um, but for uh, for URL fragments, it does not send anything after the hash shine, the hashtag. So all of this information is not sent to the server. So like our server only sees a get request to the scan page. It does not see the signature, the issuer, or the content. So there's no way we can even log that. And so we return the page. The page has JavaScript on it. The page uses that JavaScript to look up the public key of the issuer. So it looks at the stuff after the URL fragment character, um, finds the issuer ID, finds the public key, and then uses JavaScript uh, to verify the signature matches the content. And so when you load this page here, um, if I were to reload this page and look at the network inspector for it, let me just like, I don't know that I can, you can't really see the network inspector. Um, well, if you were, if you could see this on a tiny screen, I, can, I don't know how to open it up. It's only a GET request to the scan page itself. It doesn't actually send any of the URL fragment to the server itself. So our servers never even receive any uh, QR code information. So I know that some of the other QR code scanners that are based on public key, they actually put a question mark sign here whenever they load the page. And that's what they use to verify it. And they and some of them may like try to verify um, the public key signature on the server side, which means that even if they don't retain it, they still see it. So one of the really, really cool things about URLs is you can include information in the URL that does not get sent to the server, but JavaScript on the client side can still read it. And so that was one of the key like technological things that we did. Um, that I think is really, really cool um, because it allows us to have zero knowledge of what QR codes have been issued and what QR codes have been scanned. The only thing we see is get requests to the scan page, right? I mean, we like there is the threat model of a malicious JavaScript page on our side that like the JavaScript then sends the information back to our servers, but obviously we don't want to know. And so we would never write that code anyway. So we would have to get hacked or something like I, that in order I to do that. I was going to say, Daniel, this is it's so relevant. I'll go ahead and say it. But one of my questions for you was going to be that, well, OK, this is the best use of a URL fragment I've ever seen, because basically they're only used for Wikipedia header hot links, basically. Yeah. So it's really impressive. The, the obvious major vulnerability I see is a, is a cross-site scripting attack, basically, since it's all browser-based. Yeah. yeah. OK, so I'm going to get into that, too. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, another cool feature about this website is since, uh, let me go to, nope, nope, nope. I'm just going to stay here for now. Um, another cool feature about this project is it's nothing more than a static website. That's all it is. There is no Python code running anywhere. There's no anything. This is a GitHub pages hosted site that is a Jekyll like static site. That's all it is. And so there is no risk of uh, cross site uh, scripting. There's no risk of you know application code getting hacked. It's nothing except for static files being served. And the cool thing about that is if you are running a high uh, confidence environment, say like a you know, a uh, high security conference or something like that, or a business, you want to run this for your business or something like that, right? 
it's super, super easy to rehost this because it's nothing but a static site. Like you don't actually have to run a server anywhere. You just run, you know, an Apache, I guess you have to run a server, but you don't have to run a dynamic server. So there is no dynamic requirement that is part of this. Um, and so that was one of the cool things. Like all of the issuers are just hard coded into the Jekyll site and their public keys are just hard coded into the Jekyll site. And so you can just fork the project, build your own, and then you know that it hasn't been hacked because you control the code for it. And it's super easy to like clone and rebrand and maintain. So that's really cool. Um, so yes, you're right that malicious JavaScript can do stuff, um, but it's really, really hard, easy to harden because it's a static website. You just don't have to change stuff. Like as long as I trust the GitHub pages build chain for the GitHub repo, I know that this code is, doesn't have anything in it. Well, and the fact that I assume because it's all static since there are no input fields slash uh, form posts, the ability for somebody to basically inject you and get that cross-site scripting going is hard to impossible. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. So this is um, as simple and like un, uh, it's as simple as I could make it because like as part of Open Austin, you know, I don't want to be spending money hosting servers and worried about PII and all that sort of stuff. Like this is just me trying to see if I can do it and trying to see if it'll help some local people who can't afford a multi-million dollar vaccine passport system. So like that's the intended use case for this is just a really, really simple thing that people can use and modify and, and you know, copy and stuff like that. Um, so anyway, that's, that's how the actual system works is that it uses URL fragment. It has a hard coded list of issuer IDs. And again, you can copy this and rehost it you know, on your own thing and have your own issue IDs, or you can just put your issuer ID um, directly in the list on our public GitHub repo. Um, and we have all of the tooling for that in the website. There's an issuer admin that allows you to basically, you know, uh, you know uh, register as an issuer if you want to, and we're happy to accept that. Um, another cool thing about the static website is um, to register as an issuer and also form groups of trusted issuers. So, you know, if you set a group as like, I trust these issuers, you can actually set up multiple issuers as trusted. Um, on the scan page, you can, uh, like all of that sort of conversing is done over email. So there is a form post, Kevin, in, uh, in registering as an issuer, but it's a mail to. So it does nothing except for opening your mail client and say, hey, this is my public key, please register me. And so it just goes to my in email inbox. And since it's a public key, it's public. I, 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 this will be getting, that's great. I guess this is getting even more excessively nerdy of like, well, email is not necessarily by default encrypted. They could try to fish yeah. via email. I don't know. But yeah. Well, what are they going to fish? I mean, it's it's nothing more than a public key saying, hey, this is my public key and you should add it to your list. I'm like, right. Okay. And uh, right. And I mean, how are they going to hack you with just a public key they gave you? That's a new hack yeah, exactly. I've never heard of. <laughs> yeah. So like this is all topics that I would love to discuss um, with some folks who are like looking at these, but like my goal is to get out of the way and not like try to leave myself open for exploitation. So, okay, so uh, to go over some of the features, um, like I said, no personal information is stored. All QR code scanning and verifying happens in the browser. And so no personal data is sent to the server. It's just a static website. The other cool thing about it is that it works right now you can actually clone it and use it for your own purposes, or you can send me an email and I'll register you right quick and you can spin it up and start using it right now for your own local groups. So you don't have to like, you know, go through some certification process or get, you know, suck to verified or have a security audit or whatever. Like this is not, this is not meant to be uh, externally trusted by people who don't know the issuer. This is meant to be used by people who know the issuer or know the group owner who trusts the issuer. So I guess there's two levels that you could go on that. 
Um, the other cool thing is it's all in the browser. You don't have to have an app. You can print out the QR codes on paper and scan them with you know, your mobile browser. You can use a webcam on your computer or laptop to scan things. You can also just like email somebody the actual PNG image and there's an image upload option. There's also just like, you can copy and paste the link that is in the image and just go to that URL. So you can include that URL in like an email or something like that. Um, and that'll work as well. So it's incredibly flexible on how you get it working and it requires no proprietary software. Um, the last thing is that, you know, it's obviously free and open source. Um, it's, we encourage rebranding. So you can just copy, clone the repo or fork the repo and spin up your own version of it and get your own trusted network going. Like it's, you're free to do that. Like the, the logos are literally QR codes that link to vax.codes. And so I, yeah, it's, it's pretty cool how I actually played around. This is me experimenting on this vax.codes up here is actually a valid QR, QR code that links to vax codes. Um, if you want, if you can scan it and also the the one at the beginning as well. That's our that's our logo as well. So all the QR codes work. It's pretty fun. Um, okay, so uh, the other cool thing is one of the GitHub items that I want to do is I want to make the scan page iframable and have an API that you can use to scan things embedded in other websites. So you would basically be able to embed in an iframe the scan page, and then the scan page would admit to the parent frame a, you know, hey, this is the verification result after you scan a code. Or, oh, I scanned a QR code, but it wasn't some, it wasn't a uh, VAX code QR code, that sort of thing. And so what that allows you to do is it allows you to basically incorporate scanning into anything. Well, and I'll say there's another reason that you going with a static site is a very smart decision because you avoid all the cores issues with iframes if it's purely static. <laughs> yeah, um, that is also true. And also I don't have to worry about scalability. Like static websites now can soak up so many requests. Like I, I, I think GitHub has a soft limit of like a terabyte or something like that for their GitHub pages. And so like if some really popular thing, popular app includes this scanner in their, like in an iframe there, I don't care. Like that's fine. It's a static website. Right. It, it's literally just, here you go. No computation needed. <laughs> yeah. All the computation happens on the client side. Um, the other thing that is potentially really cool about this project is that there's no reason that the scanner has to only scan VAX code QR codes. It, in theory, could scan any other vaccine passport QR codes and it could all happen in the browser. And so like I wrote the code on the scanner page to actually allow for other types of QR codes to be scanned. So for example, the New York one, like I would like, there's an open GitHub issue on this project to add support for that. And yes, that may need a, uh, a dynamic server for that specific type of one, because that's the way that that particular protocol works. But the idea could be for this project to turn it into a universal scanner for vaccine passports in addition to its own um, scanner. So you don't have to have an app installed in order to scan, uh, scan a vaccine passport. So you can just kind of you know, say, oh, I just go to vax codes and press scan and I can scan any type of vaccine passport. Well, even beyond that, it seems to me it wouldn't be very hard to extend this project to be a community-based trust verification system for almost anything, not just vaccines. Sure. Now we're getting into the verified credentials Linux Foundation sort of project realm, and I feel like at that point, I want somebody else to take over this project. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just saying that I, 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 the anarchist in me sees all sorts of fun things sure, you could sure. do with this basic concept. Yeah, um, I mean, the basic concept is it's a public key infrastructure. That's all it is. It's a really, really simple, like, implementation of a public key infrastructure. Um, so I know there were a few questions we had in chat. If uh, you've kind of reached the end of what you formally had to say, I can field those to you. But I don't want yeah, to Yeah, I just had one... Yeah, you have one, one more, more thing. Yeah. yeah, one more thing. Um, 
So, so where do we fit in in the whole vaccine passport scene? So Vax Codes fits in like it's extremely easy to start using for small groups who have an existing trust network. Um, so all the tooling is pre-made. You just like, it all works on the website. We actually have command line instructions for GPG. If you want to do it on the command line, it's actually pretty cool. You can do everything you do on the website, on the command line, on a Linux server or Mac, or I guess Windows shell. So that's pretty cool. Um, so I encourage everybody to check that out. If you don't trust our website, we just give you the commands to run using GPG. It's great. Um, it's free to rehost and copy. There's no apps. Um, it can be paper-based for recipients. So to answer your equity issue, like you don't have to have a phone in order to have a vaccine, you know, code, uh, there's no information, personal information from the URL fragment received because everything's, um, client side and it like, it's all based around ad hoc trust systems. So it can be decentralized. It can be fragmented. There's no central authority to track what QR codes are issued to who or anything like that. So that's pretty cool. Um, so we feel like our best fit is with small organizations who don't have the money to do a full passport, like vaccine passport system. Like this is really made for people who just want to see how they can meet in person again. Right. <laughs> So that might actually be a good, uh, good thing for Texas now that state level vaccine stuff is banned. So I have a whole bunch of use cases. There's a whole lot more use cases on the website. Um, and the last slide that I, I'd like to say is like, we need volunteers to help contact organizations that uh, would find this useful. So one of the major issues that we have in the project right now is like, I have a full-time job. I have a lot of stuff that I have to do. Like, I don't have the time to do outreach to people. Um, and so I like, we need help doing outreach to people who might find this useful because the, our problem right now is nobody knows this exists. Nobody knows how, like how easy it is. Nobody knows like all of these press articles around vaccine passports, they all mention the major players. And so like every, every, all these local organizations, I think are getting in the mindset that this is like, we can't do that. Like open EFF Austin, there's no way that they're going to be able to implement some sort of vaccine passport system that's being mentioned in the press. And so, well, and, and, like, and frankly, with the proposals in the press, with all the uh, legitimate concerns around privacy and equity, we wouldn't want to use one of those systems, frankly. Yeah, exactly. So outreach is the major need right now, the first and most important major need. And there's also a bunch of features we want to add to this, uh, to the system. We want to like, currently it's only in English. That's bad. We should have it in, in multiple languages. So I encourage people to go to the GitHub, um, and check out the issues that are marked as help wanted and see if they can help. Like we need more people, um, helping with outreach and we need more people helping with, uh, feature additions. Great. So yeah, that's uh, I had some brainstorm topics, but we can get into the questions now. Uh, cool. Um, one question I had, um, uh, I believe from George, was just um, so: is there any safeguards in this system towards somebody who basically forged a paper vaccine card and showed it to an issuer? Is there any way for the issuer to be confident they're being shown a real card? There. Well, that is actually a GitHub issue: is implementing whitelists and blacklists. So um, there's a couple of assumptions or uh, ideas around that. Um, the first one is um, if you assume the issuer keeps a record of uh, all of the QR codes that they've issued, um, in this GitHub issue, one of the like one of the implementation options is to an issuer can mark on their registration whether or not they have uh, a blacklisted uh, QR codes. And if they do, if they have that marking, say yes, check blacklists, it, we can create a new API endpoint with the hashes of those QR codes. And so when somebody scans that QR code, we will check the issuer, it verifies, we see that it has a black, or we see that it has um, uh, a blacklist entry and we don't verify it at that point. And so um, actually we would probably check the blacklist prior to even trying to verify the signature. I don't know. Up for debate on that. Um, but yes, so that, that is one situation where um, an issuer can um, basically say, whoops, if they have the original QR code that they issued to that person. 
right? If they find out later, so they can just basically blacklist that one QR code. Gotcha. On the opposite side, um, there's actually a public key. Uh, 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 sorry, each issuer can have multiple public keys associated with their issuer uh, registration. And so let's say a public key gets compromised. Like they accident, their computer gets stolen and they consider that public key compromised. If they have a list of all of the uh, QR codes that they've issued up to date that they know are still good, they can actually mark one of those public keys as, you know, only whitelist only. And then, you know, put the hashes of those in the API and then create a new public key and set their registration to have that new public key. So one of the public keys is whitelist only of these pre-approved. So nobody loses their ability um, mm -hmm. to get verified. And then they start issuing with a new one. Mm -hmm. And so both blacklisting and whitelisting is totally possible within this. What is not possible is time-based because you can totally fake a creation time on PGP like open PGP signatures. So like, I don't want to have anything to do with time base. It's either an all or nothing sort of thing. Gotcha. Um, another question I got for you is, uh, could you host this on a Raspberry Pi? Absolutely. I you figured the answer on, would be yes. <laughs> you could host this on an ESP8266. Like <laughs> I was going to say, if it's all static, I think you could use some pretty old tech and it would still work. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. And it's not that big either. Like if you look at the page size, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, let me actually see. So if I reload this page and disable caching, uh, it looks like my total transferred size is 254 kilobytes. So uh, also, with, also, Daniel, I have to say, I have something from the peanut gallery saying it's an ESP8266. <laughs> Oh, damn it. So close. So close. <laughs> uh, so, so yeah, it's a tiny, like it's less than a megabyte in total, like actual size for the scan page, including all the CSS and JavaScript and everything. And so like you can fit that on a really, really tiny embedded device if you want. So you could probably fit it on a local handheld thing um if you wanted to i mean i mean yeah you're what you're telling me there is even a computer from the early to mid 90s would have no problem with this yeah. thing <laughs> well i mean it probably so a lot like this is a lot of this stuff assumes a modern browser with the webcam and stuff well, like that so, yes yeah. yes you'd run into like yes there'd be driver issues and other things if you were actually using a super old computer but <laughs> yeah but resource wise um, okay. it's incredibly lightweight Yes. Yeah. No, it was um, eventually, I think it would be really cool on some of the other websites that I've created. Um, I've actually added the ability where you can just right click and save the website as a like static file on your local like computer and then be able to still use it and open it in on just your local computer and it still works. I haven't done that for this because I think some stuff is loaded after the page loads. So I don't think it saves correctly. Anyway, the point is that I guess maybe in theory, uh, you should be able to do that, but uh, I don't know that that works right now. And I don't know that I want to necessarily work on, I feel like that's not worth it on this project. Like you can just clone the repo and host it yourself. Another uh, question I have, and uh, I don't at all know what the answer to this would or wouldn't be, but uh, one person said that uh, they noticed some similarities with the uh, MyPass project. They're wondering if it shares code or cryptographic concepts or developers at all. Um, it does not, um, mostly because I coded this and I know nothing about the MyPass. I, I figured that would be the answer because I looked at your GitHub repo and I'm like, Daniel's the contributor to this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, the answer is no, there is no cross code or anything like that. I actually, like I've been so busy with my, my real job that I actually haven't done a lot of technical research into the other vaccine passport systems besides just some cursory reading of websites and stuff like that. And so that's why there's a GitHub issue of, you know, with the help wanted of comparing this to other systems for people who kind of want to dig into the technology of all of these, because I totally wouldn't be surprised if there are other systems that are, that do not retain the PII of the people 
in um, yeah. in a database somewhere. Yeah, that even ties into the next question where somebody asked, are there any other open source projects like this? And I guess your answer would yes. be there could quite possibly be, but you've been busy and don't know about all of them. Yeah, so I know that the Linux Foundation, if you Google Linux Foundation vaccine passport, I know that they do have an initiative that is kind of working on that. Um, I believe it is built off of the um, verified credentials open standard. Um, I am unfamiliar with what sort of information it contains. They did have like an example thing, but it didn't use a URL fragment. It uses a um, query question mark uh, parameter in the in the URL, so the server does see the contents of the code. Um, so I don't know, like it, I haven't really dug into it, but but this is actually me asking for help. I would love if somebody dug into it and figured out the differences and created a, you know, a table on our website that compares them and then maybe add support in the scanner for all of those. Like I really want, I'm totally fine with this thing being able to scan other people's codes. Right, right. And well, yeah, and I, I totally hear you, though, about just not having the time. I mean, my day job keeping me so busy that it didn't even, I didn't even fully rock when we first scheduled this. Oh, I might be wading into very controversial waters because I was just like, well, Daniel is going to do it right. So I'm not at all worried about his proposal from these <laughs> issues, basically. Well, I, mean, <laughs> I hope it's right. Like, well, I don't know. Well, I mean, I'll say as a programmer, like, you're certainly QR making codes. a lot. As a programmer, you're making a lot of choices I like, and you certainly have addressed many of the valid concerns around equity and privacy from what I can see. I'm sure even smarter geeks on this might flag things I haven't noticed. I mean, I think one question somebody might have, uh, and I guess, um, you know, I, I might be misrepresenting, but um, I had a, a, a private question about this, and I think I'm not going to, uh, you know, we believe in privacy, so I won't say who exactly, and I'm, I'm going to just sort of paraphrase a bit of the question a little bit with, I think, you know, somebody might rightfully just kind of have a, a norms question about this of just like, you know, you know, on the one hand, the anarchist to me loves that you're making this a community's own personal decision around this stuff. But I think somebody might fairly ask, like, well, you know, you know, that it's all well, I guess, you know, you could make a norms argument of like, technological solutions involving gating people's participation and movement in communities, even if it's very decentralized and community-based, is there just, you know, a question about like, well, fine, you're doing it to verify the health of your community, but what if this started turning into verifying something more, you know, what most of us would agree is shitty, like a genomic yeah. ancestry or something. And, and you could say, well, go to a community that wouldn't do that shitty thing. But what if it became widespread enough that without any central authority, you're still potentially violating somebody's rights? Yeah. Yeah. Like I, I would be completely satisfied if this project becomes obsolete in the next six months because vaccines get so prevalent that you just kind of don't even need to ask anymore. And so I'd be totally fine if the life cycle of this project is less than a year. It was a fun coding experiment. I learned a lot about QR codes. I learned a lot about like client-side open PGP JS. I learned a lot about like client-side scanning of, bar of QR codes. I learned a lot about how QR codes are made. And I learned a lot about permissioning system for webcams and cameras on the different mobile devices. Like I, this has been, I already consider this project a huge win. Um, and so, yeah. Um, well, I've already, um, I already am, um, one participant's already even saying that they've already commented on the press issue and requested access to the drive. Um, and then I guess just finally, you know, like, I guess another issue, once again, tying into the question I was asked privately was just, well, you know, this, there's also potentially lack of nuance in this solution. Like, what if there's a person who they've already had COVID and they haven't had the shot, but they're like, well, I have COVID. I probably am immune because usually once you get a virus, you're immune to it. I don't want to get a shot, but I can't prove I had COVID necessarily with a vaccine card or, it's, or something. Right. So, uh, so, so, I, I, so I guess the, the general concern would be, well, what do you do about edge cases where somebody it doesn't quite fit into this verification scheme? Yeah. That's a specific example. 
Yeah. So say you're like immunocompromised or something like that. Oh, right. That's another good example. The ability to get yeah. the vaccine or something like that. That's yeah. another great example. So, um, in those sort of situations, I look to existing vaccine verification systems, which is schools. Like schools require vaccine like records, that sort of thing. And you can totally go to school if you have a doctor's note that says, oh, they're not eligible or they had this already or whatever. And so like it's since the contents of the QR code is arbitrary, you can totally write whatever you want as the local issuer and have gotchas and have exceptions. It's not up to us, uh, it's not up to VAX codes to actually determine if somebody has been verified. It's up and to that's the, the whole point of this, the, the way you've done it, where like you're leaving yeah. it up to individual communities. They get to decide what counts as proof yes. and what exceptions they exactly. accept. This will totally work in a local community that has decided, okay, we just want to like you have not only testing, but also antibody testing, but also vaccines or all that sort of stuff. You can totally like, if you're the issuer and the local people trust you, you can issue QR codes for all those groups. Like, and Vax codes will have no idea. We don't see QR codes. We don't ever receive information about them. Like we have no idea how you're using the system. Basically, if you're an issuer, you set the rules. Like you yes. could literally be whitelisting everyone, and Vax Codes has nothing to say about it. Yeah, basically. yeah. And like, if some people trust you, that's on them. Like, it's not uh, like otherwise. Like, if you register and then just issue a shit ton of QR codes, like it, the the scanner, as you saw with that scan, like it's you need to personally know and trust the test movie theater in order to trust it. Right. Um, I think we have a raised hand uh, from Christopher here. Okay. You have a question? I can try and unmute you if there's an issue. Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, yeah. uh, oh, you got me now? Okay, I unmuted myself. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Do you think they could put this uh, QR scanner on, on water fountains so, you know, so we could have vaccinated water fountains and, un and unvaccinated water fountains? <laughs> I as I always say, that that will EFF happen. Austin allows any question, so I welcome Daniel's yeah, no. reply to that. <laughs> no, I highly doubt that that would actually be a use case, mostly because this is going to be completely obsolete inside of six months, probably. And also, I feel like, yeah, I, I, I something that hyper local is probably not going to be any sort of, um, oh any sort of any sort of concern for something like this. But again, like this is a tool, so we don't control it. Obsolete in six months, I don't quite understand. Uh, every, there will be enough people vaccinated that you don't have to even ask if you're vaccinated anymore. Because they'll just be herd immunity. Because It'll just be herd immunity. It. So if somebody isn't, it no longer really matters at that point from a safety yeah, standpoint. Yeah, maybe for like, maybe for like international travel and stuff like that. But like for local gatherings, it'll just be similar to, uh, I don't know, any sort of other vaccine rollout. So it'll also, just have ubiquity. Also, Daniel, I assume that if it, you caught wind that somebody who was an issuer in the system was flagrantly violating civil rights in a like separate drinking fountain sort of way, you could probably yeah. revoke their issuer, couldn't you? Yeah, I mean... <laughs> Yes. I mean, if they've rehosted it on their own site, then there's nothing we can do about it because it's open source. But like, yeah, if they've registered on Vax codes, like all of the issuers are public on the GitHub repo. And so if anybody has any issues or anything like that, they can file a support ticket or not a support ticket, a uh, GitHub issue. And like, we can look at removing them. So, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, I believe the project itself falls under the open Austin code of conduct. And so the open Austin code of conduct is pretty uh, restrictive on being an open community and, and uh, encouraging all, um, all comers. And so I don't think, uh, I don't think we would find any issue with uh, removing somebody who's been registered if their codes are being misused in some discriminatory fashion. And I guess, George, to answer your question, uh, Austin vaccine rollout, last I checked, I think 40% of Travis County has at least had their first, first dose at this point. So decent rollout yeah. speed here. 
Yeah. So, I mean, it could be that this actually not like, uh, it could be that this actually just isn't a problem by the time people start using it. Like if it takes a couple of weeks to spin up, you might already have um, enough people vaccinated. So yeah, I don't, I don't, I would not be surprised if this is obsolete before it gets traction. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's a, I'm actually very, very impressed with the speed at which the vaccine has been rolled out so far. I mean, you know, it's still, you know, assuming there are someday potentially future pandemics, it, it does strike me as a useful liminal space tool that might become relevant again at uh, some point in the future. And as I yeah. said, I don't see it being terribly hard to extend this to anarchist community trust networks more generally, not just vaccines. Yeah. It's, it's an interesting yeah. idea. And I, I do like that it's promoting software that involves as little data sharing as possible, that more software yeah. needs to be built around these principles. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah, it, no, that was the goal. Because I mean, every time we have a new problem, the, the instinct initially seems to be, let's have some big data panopticon thing that solves it. And I just get so mad every time because I'm like, guys, there's ways to code software that doesn't involve a dumpster fire like that and so anything we can do to push people out of that being their first thought i think is good yeah and, and um I, yeah and i and i guess just also i will just give a little both eff and eff austin sort of thing that like you know most of the vaccine passport proposals we see do not show the wisdom of design and thought on these issues that Daniel's solution does. Like from what I've read of many of them, you see so many issues from a civil liberties and equity and privacy perspective. I mean, and, and, and believe me, there are orgs who would totally love to use this as a backdoor to a national ID system involving biometrics, which is a complete dumpster fire of rights issues that, you know, I even linked at the beginning of this meeting, EFF has a great rundown of why national ID systems in general, but also ones involving biometrics are very, very problematic and something that yeah. should probably not be encouraged and pushed back on. So I like that, I, you know, maybe I'm not enough of a super villain to see it, but I don't see how somebody would really bootstrap Daniel's idea into that very easily. Just the software architecture well, doesn't support it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it is heavily, you would have to contort it pretty heavily. Um, and there are so many better tools for that sort of exactly. like discrimination and stuff. So like if you're going to implement a, you know, a water fountain segregation system for vaccinated, non-vaccinated people, like you're going to use one of the big centralized things. You're not going to use this. <laughs> Yeah, similar to with like, yeah, if you're going to implement a genomic discrimination thing, I think you can just uh, find out whatever vendor China is using with the Uyghurs. You know, people have already piloted these horrible, horrible ideas, you know? Yeah. No, this is, this is mostly for, hey, can we have a meetup yet? Like, that's really the question that this is answering. Right, exactly. And I mean, as I said, I, what I like about it is that you know, it isn't fair to ask small communities to solve a major public health problem uh, where, you know, it is valid for a community of 25 people who are an affinity group to want to feel some sense of safety when they're gathering. And, and so it's valid for them to want that. So us trying to find a way for they can have that in a way that does respect privacy and equity and civil liberties, like, you know, as, as I keep saying, this is it's a false dichotomy to say that we have to pick one or the other. There are ways, as Daniel's shown, where we can use the existing tech we have to try yeah. to solve these problems in ways that respect people's rights. Because, you know, getting inadvertently sick can be viewed as a violation of somebody's rights as well, you know. So it's about balancing competing rights to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Yeah. Um, okay, so this is my, this is the project contact stuff. It's all on the website. It's also on, so the main, the Slack channel um, mm -hmm. that we have at Open Austin is um, uh, p-vax-codes. Um, and also we have GitHub issues and stuff like that. Um, it's a volunteer run project. There's no money involved or anything like that. Really the only requirement is the Open Austin code of conduct. Um, let's see here. 
I think that is about it for my talk. I had a couple of brainstorming ideas, like what are the implications of Governor Abbott's vaccine passport ban? Is that like, uh, I don't, I haven't heard any reactions from folks who have civil liberties based things. I'm, I'm guessing it's a, just a purely a Molotov cocktail strategy of taking um, attention away from the uh, energy crisis. So just like the opening everything back up is just like when you, when something's on fire, throw another Molotov cocktail and then everybody's attention goes to that. And when then everything's like, you know, starting to, you know, heat up on that one, throw another Molotov cocktail and, you know, everybody. Yeah. You know, heats up I, on that. I mean, you know, Abbott, you know, this, you know, you, there's not, even if <laughs> you like, like that Abbott doesn't want a state-based vaccine passport system, which as I've been saying this whole meeting, you absolutely could think those are bad from a equity or privacy perspective. And, and, you know, frankly, I have concerns about major systems like that. That being said, I don't think anybody who follows Governor Abbott very much as I do when tracking these sort of digital liberties issues, could, it's any, he's not doing this out of any genuine higher principle. This is like chum for his base. At the same time, if he was to actually extend this to like be a total ban where you couldn't even do a personal business community-based solution the way Daniel's proposing, well, funny, I thought he's all for letting small businesses do whatever they want, you know, um, until he isn't, you know. I Regardless of how you feel on these issues and whether you're liberal or conservative, I don't have any respect for any politician on either side of the aisle who changes their beliefs when it's politically convenient. And Abbott mm -hmm. is quite adept at doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, George, yes. Did, didn't, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, good. Yeah, I had to pull up my microphone. When he um, overrode local communities on the mask ban, Oh, he has a whole history of doing this. He's done it with plastic bag bans, fracking bans. Um, homeless, yeah. The homeless situation. And well, yeah, Austin, they're right. No, he yeah. it's yeah, he has a long history of not actually supporting communities passing their own laws when he ideologically disagrees with them. It's kind of interesting, too, that, you know, Texas has a sort of tradition of keeping the government out of my business, including businesses, and those go against that kind of thing. And he's also seeming to be involved in the voter rights issues that are going on too. Man, I'm so glad. I mean, <laughs> not Wait. saying the governor of New York doesn't have his own problems, but- He certainly he has to, his own issues, but I- He's not I, trying I, to I kill take... me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, Abbott, I, you know, not to derail because, you know, at EFF Austin, uh, yeah. <laughs> at EFF Austin, you know, I, I'll just say this. There are plenty of libertarians who I, you know, to, in case you can't tell, I'm pretty far, far left personally, politically, but there are plenty of libertarians that we at EFF and EFF Austin totally see eye to eye with on many of the issues we both fight for. I don't have any issue with principled uh, conservative people. Many have served on our board and many have contributed vitally to this discussion. I just don't think Abbott is one of those principled people. <laughs> oh, speaking of which, I just have to bring it up. Uh, Ted Cruz was on Colbert last night, and they played a clip of his book that came out today. Um, oh, are you talking about John Boehner, actually? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. It was about uh, Ted Cruz. So John Boehner had a book come out today, and he was on Colbert last night, and they played a clip, audio clip of his book from uh, Audible. And he says something just, you know, a regular sort of philosophical thing. And, he, and then he says, uh, P.S. Um, Ted Cruz, go fuck yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, after surviving a week uh, in the freezing snow with no water for five days that and while he was running off to Mexico, that that kind of echoes my feelings, too. Oh, yeah. um, but, you know, as I said, uh, try to keep my own personal political opinions out of the EFF Austin official forums, although I will certainly rant and rave at parties and social events. <laughs> yeah, I just brought it up because I thought it was hilarious. I couldn't stop laughing. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. Well, anyway, do we have any uh, final questions for Daniel before maybe I cut everybody loose a little early? 
Um, I actually wanted to go through, there's a lot that could go wrong with vaccine passports by the ACLU. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I shared those precisely because I feel that there's plenty of people like Abbott who are criticizing vaccine passports without saying anything very intelligent, but people like the ACLU or EFF are raising real strong points about the concern about how these systems can be misused. Yeah. It says, uh, but digital as uh, we would oppose vac- a vaccinated credential system that does not meet three crucial criteria. It's not exclusively digital. So that's the print out your QR codes. A lot of people don't have smartphones. So that's that. Um, it's decentralized and open source. So that's that. Uh, does not allow for tracking or creation of new databases. So that's that. It's a static website. Hooray! The, the only database you have is the issuers. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> Yep. Yeah. Hey, I passed this without even knowing it. That's great. All right. Well, why don't you could, if you want to check EFFs, they raise similar concerns. I don't think theirs is quite as nicely, easily bulleted as that. But uh, yeah. Haley, who I actually have met and, be, and good friends with at EFF, she wrote EFFs rundown on their concerns. It, it's very similar to the ACLU's concerns. Yeah. Yeah, this is the verified credential system. Is a potential you stayed way. away from blockchain, so you avoided one oh, of her major god. criticisms. It's not a silver bullet. Oh my god! Yeah, so I mean, the one thing that uh, a like time stamped based blockchain thing would be for, would be for cutting off public keys at a certain time, but. The only way you could do that is you would have to actually put some sort of identifier or hashed like derivative on the blockchain for each QR code so that you could basically timestamp each QR code that was issued. Um, So you couldn't backdate QR codes. Um, And yeah, that means that you're actually saving it in the database somewhere or some piece of information or some derived piece of information. So like that's a non-starter. This is something that I don't get why so many people don't get. I think they got the wrong solution looking for a problem. Well, I think a lot of people got the wrong idea that because back in the old days, Bitcoin was used for Silk Road drug transactions, that they somehow think Bitcoin is like and blockchain is anonymous or private. And I'm like, Ah. it's the opposite of private. It's a permanent public record. (laughs) Yeah. So, yeah. So played with inequitable access. Um. Yeah, I think that the the fact that the vaccine rollout is going so well and and happening so quickly, like it's not going to take a year and a half to happen. I feel like the inequity problem is, and Austin has a specific initiative to try to make the vaccine rollout equitable or more equitable. Um, it, I feel like that's a lot of these problems, like I'm really glad that I worked on this project, but I feel like three years from now, it'll just be like, oh yeah, I worked on that way back when it's on my daylightpirates.org website. You know, I'm not, I'm not seeing a huge industry build up. Like, I feel like there's a lot of land grab from, you know, entrepreneurs and big enterprise corporations to get multi-hundred million dollar deals from New York state or something like that. And I just don't see those lasting very long because it's going to reach ubiquity so quickly. So kudos to the people rolling out the vaccine. Yeah, uh, and, and you know, th- there will be plenty of other things that uh, National ID biometric authoritarians can use to try to uh, backdoor uh, their proposals, you know, I don't, you know, I agree that this will be done so quick, they may not be able to use COVID for it, but you know, it, independent of vaccines, they'll find something else they want to justify it for, so uh, you know, I think that, you know, there's still the issue of trying to solve public health problems, you know, authoritarians are going to authoritarian whatever they're using as the back door (laughs) yeah um uh there was a question in chat uh do you know what open austin meetup is going to cover tomorrow so the open austin meetup community action nights are um basically where project leads um split off into groups and like when they were in person you would actually physically split off into groups and work on your projects um but in this case you split off into your own slack channel uh you know calls and uh work on whatever project you're working on so there is a project that is focused on um making sure that tenants have uh good responses for uh landlord questions so things like if you have something 
leaky uh, sink or leaky house or you have a pipe burst or whatever. It's basically a text chat app. You can you know, resolve those issues. There's also an eviction court scraper to basically create machine readable uh, versions of the eviction filings at the court so that people can um, really quickly and easily, you know, see if they're going to be evicted or not. <laughs> um, so that's a, that's another part of, I would say that both of those, well, one is energy crisis related, obviously with burst pipes and the other is um, uh, pandemic related with, uh, with, uh, of course, evictions and, and economic follow up. So, um, there is a lot of very interesting projects going on at Open Austin, not just Vax codes. I have a couple of other projects that I work on, Ballot API and Purge Alert um, at Open Austin that is mostly voter focused. So I encourage you to show up, find a project you like, or start your own project and, and create a group. Well, great. And yeah, and I encourage everyone uh, to check out Open Austin. Great people doing great stuff. I, uh, I worry a little less about that, even as a coder, that I don't always have uh, the time because of my day job to uh, work on wonderful civic projects like this, but I worry about it less because people like Daniel and Open Austin are working on these problems. So I know at least somebody good is doing it. Yeah. <laughs> and spread the word, please spread the word. Like for the love of God, to, like forward this video to your friends, like forward this talk to your friends, forward everything to your friends, tell the EFF to put this talk back online once they watch <laughs> the video and tell them to reach out to me. Well, as I said, God, Daniel, I'm going to be talking side. with Nash <laughs> on Thursday, and I will emphasize, emphasize, emphasize that you would love to chat with him personally and chat yeah. to answer any questions he has. <laughs> yes. We'll I'm do, on their we'll side. Do. And I should, I should make clear, you know, there's a hundred EFA groups, you know, they don't like look at every event we're all holding. And so by the time Nash was like, wait a minute, I have some questions about this. I didn't have time before the meetup to do anything about it, frankly. <laughs> Yeah, no worries. No worries at all. All right. Well, any final questions for Daniel? Uh, and, uh, to your question, Grayson, um, yes, we will have all, we, all our meetups end up on our YouTube channel. Um, whenever Kevin gets around to it, usually there can often be a couple months where I don't upload them and then a whole bunch of them will get uploaded at once. But at some point, yes, and I'll try to make it soon, this will be on our YouTube channel. Cool. Thank you, both of you, all of you. Yeah, thanks so much. And I want to, I want to thank all of you for coming, and I want to uh, thank all of you for being willing to uh, respectfully engage and talk about what is a very hard question and uh, grappling with creative outside the box solutions about it. Uh, you know, I feel like EFF of Austin, we're here to be on the cutting edge of asking these technology questions, uh, so that. You know, technology can serve us, not the other way around, as I always say. <laughs> all right, well, thank you all. We'll have a talk uh, next month. Uh, I don't know exactly what the topic is yet, but I know um, our old friends, uh, Michael Running Wolf and Caroline Old Coyote, uh, who were at our party a few years ago, are going to call in and uh, talk to us about what they've been working on. Uh, Michael is a former Amazon engineer who's now a CS prof, but they're very brilliant, smart people, and I look forward to whatever they're going to be presenting on. So, uh, yeah, I'll give you the rest of your time back, everyone, but uh, stay safe. Hopefully, we'll be able to all meet in the flesh soonish. And um, and thank you as always for supporting us. It really means a lot. <laughs> Can Hi, everyone. Before, yeah, before you just cut out, I, I have a question yeah. for Daniel. And a question. Oh, oh, yeah. Anybody who wants to leave can go ahead and leave. But uh, yes, yeah. one last question. What's that? Um, so, Daniel, regarding uh, Open Austin, um, you know, I've been in Buffalo, but I've got time to do stuff. But I'm more um, an embedded sort of hardware software person. Is there anything going mm -hmm. on with that kind of stuff? Um, I'm not sure. So, I would encourage you to ask that question in the uh, general channel in the Open Austin Slack. I okay. I, I I don't know. I I'm not currently out of the projects that I know, but that doesn't necessarily mean that somebody is currently working on spinning up a project that okay. is involved with hardware. Yeah, it's a good idea because there's something I may be working on here that um, that might have some. Uh, I might be able to get some information about it. Um, there's Great. actually, um, this is actually kind of cool. There's a company in Buffalo that is, they're called Shared Mobility. 
and they're working on rolling out e-bikes for people who are, you know, economically disadvantaged and need transportation. And they acquired like 3,100 of the bikes that Uber got rid of when they, when they got, um, they stopped jump bike and they were going to junk them. They were actually going to throw them in a dump and they were sort of like, uh, socially guilted into doing something useful with them and they donated over 3000 to this company in Buffalo. So I'm trying to get involved. I don't think they're, they're a small group and they don't yet realize that they're going to need to do something about the electronics just for spare parts. And right. I'm, you know, I'm willing to do that, but I, you know, the idea of talking to people in open Austin about what might be out there. Um, yeah. I actually had talked to somebody um, I don't know if he was involved in Open Austin, but he was a friend of uh, uh, Ashland's. But so, yeah, I'll attend tomorrow and I'll, I'll get back on that Slack. Great. Um, yeah. Cool. Yeah, your talk was really good. And I really Thank enjoyed you. your uh, the voting one back, you know. Oh, really? Yeah, the cool. Who did I actually vote for? Uh, is that what it was called? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah I, I looked that. through. I mean, I'm, you know, I wasn't in um, Texas to actually get, you know, that printout yeah. to do it, but I totally would have. Yeah. The fact that you <laughs> had little check marks and did it manually was pretty cool. And I did it on this election too. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Kevin, I, you mentioned yes. you're talking to Nash on Thursday. I am too. Are we doing this together? Is this, I don't, I, I don't know. I don't believe so. This is just, okay, I, I spun this up in general because I had larger questions I wanted to ask Nash about. Um, okay. Um, you know, cause his main issue was just that he thought, you know, as he said, and I should tell you this, Daniel, he had no doubt that we were going to discuss this in a complex, nuanced fashion. I mean, you know, he knows me, he respects me, and I vouch right. for you. The issue was just, he was like, well, somebody seeing the meetup with just the text might get the wrong idea about our stance. And so I wanted to ask him, okay, how do I handle in general meetups of two types? One, where I'm basically letting somebody pitch a project of theirs you know, it's not just a talk or a seminar, they're pitching a project of theirs, but admittedly, I think it's a project that supports EFF or EFF Austin values. How do I need to promote that in a way that doesn't get EFF into trouble? And finally, what if I have a speaker who we categorically don't endorse or don't support? Like I had the head of Oric Austin's Fusion Center speak a few years ago. We do not support him. And so I just wanted to clarify with Nash, what do I need to do in the verbiage on these events that won't make uh, it confusing for EFF people who just stumble upon the words and have no other context? Right, right, right. Yeah, no, like I'm totally not a big deal. I just like, I, I really, our problem with this project has been getting people to actually talk to us. So I encourage like people from EFF to reach out to us and to, you know, Hey, it would be great if they wrote a blog post actually dissecting our project and how it like. Well, met as with I tried to tell criteria. them, Dan I tried to tell them Daniel's the kind of guy who, if you literally went through bullet point by bullet point and showed how his proposal is a terrible idea, he wouldn't take offense. He wants to know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So um, yeah, I, as I said, when initially I got the email, I was initially just like, what the hell, Daniel's a great guy, what on you, EFF, you know, I, I'm all about your values, how could you doubt me, but I, I yeah. took a deep breath and I'm like, they're just trying to do their job, so you know, I'm yeah. just going to yeah, talk yeah. with Nash and make sure we sort it out so that there's no, no confusion in the future. <laughs> it, it's funny because I, um, when I saw the sweatshirt that they had, um, I got in touch with Cindy because um at the south by southwest thing oh maybe i messaged you this i forget but at the uh yeah i think you you did i think you mentioned this uh this yeah thing. so yeah. she ended up for me matt to nash and i meet with him to start something here well that's great I'm, I, I'm really I, glad you're working on a chapter up there uh you know yeah, glad, totally glad you're staying involved them. Well, I totally mentioned them, how I was involved with uh, EFF Austin, and I know you personally, and they were like, totally, oh, yeah, that's a that's a good resource, yeah. 
We on him. <laughs> oh yeah, no. Uh, I mean, uh, definitely. Uh, you know, if anything, you know, we we uh, I have a very good relationship with many many people at EFF, and so if anything, I just had a moment of like, no, don't think I failed you. No, yeah. <laughs> you know, but it's just you know. It, it, that's the thing, you know, uh, it's just people trying to do their jobs and do it well. And as I said, you know, this is one thing I actually like about EFM. As, as they said, we ain't your boss. We ain't authoritarians. We aren't here to tell you how to run your org. We just had these concerns. <laughs> yeah. Who was the, right. um, you, you had someone, there was a speaker before COVID, well, before I moved, um, from EFF who was in town and we sat around in a patio on a bar. Do you remember that person? We've name? had a few. Of I'm going to drop guys. Issue. Yeah, Daniel's got to oh, go. Okay, thanks, and Daniel. Right. Actually, I probably, I probably need to go in a minute, uh, George. So oh, maybe okay. just follow up with me on Facebook. Okay, that works. Yeah. All right. Later, everyone. Later, George. Later, Grayson. Take care.